Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. While NASA is currently working on nuclear propulsion that could deliver a crew to Mars in as little as 90 days, another company has received NASA funding that's looking to cut that time down to 30 days, but performance continues to improve the further you go, meaning that Saturn could be attainable in as little as 60 days, the edge of the solar system in less than a year. Indeed, a spacecraft like this could overtake Voyager 1 in less than a year. How is this possible with current day technology? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again welcome to another bulletin here on The Angry Astronaut. This one once again talking about bleeding edge alternative propulsion systems and this one involves technology that we already have. Now of course a lot of you are going to ex express some significant reservations about all of that simply because we're talking fusion. Fusion remains the power source that's always 20 years away. But as I have mentioned a number of times on this channel, when we're talking about companies like Pulsar Fusion, you don't need to get fusion power in order to get fusion propulsion. You can utilize the plasma that's created in a fusion reaction, which is by its very nature ionized and also extremely high velocity, and use that as your propellant. And it is a propellant that has an extremely high velocity when compared to chemical rockets or even nuclear thermal rockets. But one of the drawbacks to this type of propulsion is that you can only fuse so much propellant at a time. Therefore, you're not going to get the same kind of thrust as you're going to get out of a chemical rocket or even a nuclear thermal rocket. Or at least that was the case. Now, Helicity Space, over the last couple of years, has been promoting a different solution, a different kind of electromagnetic fusion drive that produces a hell of a lot more thrust, a thrust that is very comparable to that of a conventional rocket engine. Of course, the big difference is, is this engine can keep going for hours instead of minutes, and as a result, a spacecraft with up to 150 tons worth of mass can be propelled to Mars in as little as 30 days, perhaps even less than that. But the acceleration continues the further out you go, meaning that Saturn is attainable in just a couple of months, all the way out to a thousand astronomical units from the sun. We're talking many times further away than Pluto, blowing way past where Voyager currently is, can be attained in just over three years. How is all of this possible? Well, before we get to that, I want to give you a quick update on the state of the channel. I hate to do these sorts of things. I honestly, it, it is so uncomfortable for me to do these things, but it's just the reality. YouTube's monetization has dropped again. What's called the CPM, which I like to say stands for, come on, pay me for this mediocre content. Although I like to think that my content isn't mediocre, but in any event, the CPM represents how much money you make on every view. And those numbers have dropped and dropped and have dropped again in April. The long and the short of it is, I'm working harder, my videos are more and more successful, and I'm making less money. There's only a couple of ways out of this. Now, some of you may be thinking, why don't you just go over to X and do your stuff there? Elon says that he's going to pay really well and pay right away, that sort of thing. Unfortunately, according to many of my colleagues who have done this, Elon Musk, I don't think, has a real grasp of what YouTube and other channels actually pay. X actually pays less per ad than YouTube does. Even as deflated as YouTube CPMs are right now, X is even paying less. So it's not the greatest option. I'm definitely going to set up a monetize, some monetized content on X, but really all that means is I'm gonna be working even harder just to get a little bit of extra money out of X. So not necessarily the best solution. Obviously there's 
a couple of ways out. Number one, to get to that 1% Patreon support. 1% of my subscribers being Patreon supporters and my problems are, for the most part, over regardless of what happens to CPMs. All the details in the description if you want to do that. But the other alternative, if you don't have the money to spend, I understand, is to actually watch 30 seconds of each ad. If you watch for 30 seconds on each skippable ad, I actually get paid more. It's very helpful to me if you do that. Then, of course, don't have to watch any longer than 30 seconds. Don't have to buy anything that's being sold to you. Just watch the ad for 30 seconds and I get paid extra. And I crunch some numbers and it turns out that if you know, the average viewer were to do that, it means that you only have to watch six minutes of ads for every hour of content. That's actually pretty damn good compared to network TV. In any event, that's the end of that nonsense. Let's get on to the Helicity Fusion Drive and how it could revolutionize space travel. So first of all, if we want to get from Earth to Mars in, say, 30 days, six times faster than chemical rockets can get us there, what sort of velocity do we need? Well, the velocity ranges anywhere from 100,000 to 500,000 kilometers per hour, which is pretty damn fast. 500,000 kilometers per hour is a bit faster than the Parker Solar Probe is currently traveling, and that's by making use of an enormously powerful gravitational slingshot from the sun. Otherwise, for Voyager 1, for example, you're only looking at about 60,000 kilometers per hour, just not fast enough. And one of the reasons that this happens is because of fuel efficiency. Apollo 11, for example, had 48 tons of total payload that was sent out to the moon. This required 450 tons of liquid oxygen and RP-1, which is not very efficient at all, and it could only burn for so long and that's simply because you're not getting a whole lot of energy for the amount of propellant invested and this is the case for just about all of the chemical rocket solutions that we can use so how do you get around this well the ion engines that we currently use are much much more efficient because the propellant travels a lot faster when it leaves the nozzle however the energy available in ion engines engines are delivered generally by solar panels. Not nearly enough energy to ionize enough propellant to create the same kind of thrust that chemical rockets create. Indeed, the difference is so huge that we're talking about the same amount of thrust that you would get if you put a piece of paper on the spacecraft. So minor, minor thrust, and yeah, it keeps going and going month after month, but it still doesn't deliver a whole lot of velocity. So how do you change that? How do you get high thrust and high efficiency? Well, one way is to just superheat the propellant with a nuclear reaction, which is what nuclear thermal propulsion does. All you do is you take hydrogen fuel, the lighter the fuel, the better. You superheat it with the heat of a nuclear reaction and then drive it out the nozzle. You get about double the propellant speed, maybe triple if you have a really efficient engine out of this type of solution and a thrust that's pretty similar to a chemical rocket, meaning that you can get to Mars in perhaps 90 days instead of six months, or maybe 45 days if you add afterburners to the engine, but we're not going to get into that because this video isn't about nuclear thermal propulsion. Now another alternative is to take an ion engine and hook that up to a nuclear reactor. That allows you to ionize a lot more propellant at once, getting a lot more thrust. Still not as much thrust as a chemical rocket, but a hell of a lot more thrust than a conventional ion engine, therefore delivering a lot more efficiency and enough thrust to reduce the time frame of getting to Mars again, maybe down to 45 days, 60 
safety at the most. But still, neither of these solutions opens up the outer solar system in a reasonable amount of time. So how do we get a lot of thrust and a lot of efficiency all at the same time? Well, fusion is the next step up. Now, once again, we're not talking about the type of fusion that we've been working on endlessly in various laboratories around the world. That kind of fusion needs to produce some sort of positive power in the reaction. In other words, the amount of energy that you put into the plasma has to be less than the amount of energy you get back out of the plasma after the fusion reaction is completed. However, fusion propulsion doesn't require this. All it needs to do is create plasma. Plasma is, in itself, ionized and traveling at a high velocity once you create it. So how do you create plasma? Well, there's a variety of ways to do this. One of the ways is through a series of concentric magnetic rings. You use electromagnetic energy to compress and confine and control a fusible propellant and make that into a plasma in the process. What it does is it heats up the fuel so much with all of this electromagnetic compression that electrons break off and nuclei start to smash together in order to fuse. You don't need a nuclear reaction in order to do this. You just need a tremendous amount of power to fuel the electromagnetic field. And this is what Pulsar Fusion is working on right now. You create create the plasma with an electromagnetic field, you also control it and drive it out the nozzle with an electromagnetic field, and that plasma is traveling very, very fast. Hundreds of kilometers per second instead of 4.5 kilometers per second with a chemical rocket. However, there are drawbacks to this system. As much as I love Pulsar Fusion, there are some technological problems with it. For example, how much propellant can you fuse at a single time utilizing this method? Probably not a lot. Now, it will produce a lot more thrust than an ion engine, a lot more thrust than a wide variety of high efficiency engines, but still not nearly as much thrust as a chemical rocket will. So it still generates a lot of efficiency and it will get you to Mars a lot faster than a chemical rocket and a lot faster even than nuclear thermal. We're still talking about 30 days or so and the outer solar system may still lie out of reach with this kind of solution until fusion becomes more and more efficient, the technology becomes more advanced and you can fuse a lot more propellant at once. But how do we solve this problem with today's technology? Well, that's what Helicity wants to do. They want a scalable solution that allows you to fuse a whole lot more propellant all at the same time. And the way to do this is the same way that Starship generates a lot more thrust. And that's by having 33 engines instead of one or two. And the Helicity fusion engine has dozens of engines all producing plasma at the same time. And the way they do that is to suspend a pellet of fusible fuel, that is to say probably deuterium and tritium, and then hit it with a high-powered laser. Now, the pellet is suspended in an electromagnetic field, so we still have an electromagnetic field to compress and to control the plasma, but it's the laser that superheats the fuel pellet abruptly and quickly in order to make the substance fuse. And this fusion is taking place in every single one of these little engines. So that means you have dozens of fusion reactions being created by dozens of high energy lasers inside dozens of electromagnetic fields producing a massive amount of plasma flooding out the nozzle of the rocket. Now, interestingly enough, Helicity has also determined that it's far more efficient and easy to control plasma if you have a helix-like electromagnetic field containing it. So instead of concentric electromagnetic rings, they have this series of magnetic plectonemes, and I'm not sure if I'm even pronouncing that correctly, which generates more of a helical type of electromagnetic field 
kind of like half of a DNA strand, for example. Very interesting and very sophisticated. It's pretty impressive how well they've researched the process of a fusion reaction, how plasma behaves in an electromagnetic field. They seem to be extremely advanced in their development right now, which is one of the reasons, I think, why NASA and a number of private companies have been investing millions of dollars in this solution. Is this a better solution than Pulsar Fusion? Well, I think the jury is out about that, because even though this theoretically could generate a lot more thrust, not really sure how controllable dozens of different fusion reactions are going to be inside all of these magnetic fields. It could simply prove to be far too many fusion reactions to really realistically control, but at the same time, it's an amazing concept. So if you have a thrust that's close to the performance of, say, a Raptor engine, except the propellant is leaving the nozzle at, say, 200, 300 kilometers per second instead of four and a half kilometers per second, obviously you have way more thrust and the capability of reaching unbelievable distances from the Earth in a very short amount of time. How far? Well, let's go to the furthest extreme. One of the ideas that Helicity has put forward is the idea of sending out a space telescope well beyond the heliosphere. We're talking a distance of a thousand astronomical units or so. Not going to get into the reasons as to why this kind of telescope could give us so much more information than a telescope within the solar system. Suffice it to say that it would have a performance way beyond on James Webb or anything we have sent into space up to this point, it would have to travel about a thousand astronomical units away from the sun. That is an insane distance. We're talking over 23 times the distance from the sun to Pluto. That kind of distance would take decades, if not centuries, to reach with our current technology and current chemical engines. Voyager is not going to reach that distance for a very, very long time. And yet, this type of engine could blast a spacecraft out to that distance in a mere three and a half years. In a one year's time, it would blow right past Voyager 1. As a matter of fact, it could pick up Voyager 1 to put it into a museum later on. And this, once again, is attainable with present day technology, at least in theory. The Helicity engine is also scalable. You want more thrust, you use more plasma guns or more engines. If you want less thrust or you need to dial down your acceleration, then you simply use fewer plasma guns or fewer engines. On the surface, this would appear to be the ultimate in magnetoplasma engines and one of the most powerful engines and efficient engines that we could develop with today's technology. As a matter of fact, I can't think of anything else we could develop, at least not easily with today's technology, that it could achieve the same results. This is the sort of thing that we need to be investing in, because the types of propulsion that Helicity and Pulsar Fusion and others are talking about would revolutionize our capabilities for solar system exploration, not just with unmanned probes, but also for human colonization. And also, if you're not worried about speed quite so much, if you just want to haul a hell of a lot of cargo with the same amount of propellant, well, a fusion engine will deliver way more cargo than a chemical engine will for the same amount of propellant. We're talking 500, 600, 1,000 tons instead of 100 tons for less propellant than chemical engines could deliver. So many, many advantages to using this type of solution. And once again, I need to emphasize, there is nothing from a scientific or technological standpoint that would prevent us from developing something like this 
right now. And the only reason that we don't have more progress is because companies like Helicity and Pulsar Fusion have just not been getting enough funding. Yeah, they've been getting millions of dollars. In my opinion, they need tens of millions, maybe hundreds of millions to make these ideas a reality. Because if you can reduce the transit time between the planets, that eliminates so many problems. The effects of microgravity on the human body less amount of time they're in interplanetary space, the less of a problem that becomes. The less of a chance that a crew is going to be exposed to the radioactive disaster of a solar storm. So many reasons that we need to improve the way we travel between the planets, and Helicity has a really great idea. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, please subscribe. Once again, please consider supporting this channel on Patreon or just watch the ads. And as always, stay angry about space.